Jen Jensen is a professor of pedagogy and technology in the Faculty of Education and director of the Institute of Research on Learning Technologies at York University. Um, she received a BA and MA in English literature from the University of Washington and the University of British Columbia, respectively, uh, before completing a PhD in education at Simon Fraser University. Uh, she held a postdoc at Simon Fraser University in the School of Communication, followed by instructor positions in the education departments at both the uh, University of Simon Fraser and the University of British Columbia. She became a professor at New York University in 2001, doing out the rank of associate professor in 2006. Jen has received numerous grants over her career, some of the most notable ones include the Place of the Project, the grant for Plain Computer Environments Studio, uh, which is the sole applicant for Canadian Foundation for Innovation and Innovation Grant in 2002, totaling $475,000. With this grant, she has designed a series of educational games, including Contagion, Epidemic Self Care for Crisis, a Baroque music game, and Compare Web, about the last of which you can find in the App Store. Uh, she received multiple phase grants with SRI International, titled the Ferris Project, which stands for Virtual Environments Really Users Study to explore online gaming systems and virtual environments to better understand the links between online gamers and their real world activities understand avatars group dynamics within the virtual world. Uh, she received 495,000 to 550,000 phases one and two to the And finally, and perhaps more relevant to this talk, she received a sure partnership grant titled Feminists and Games, where she was the principal applicant and received $171,000 to assemble <coughs> to assemble an international research association of digital media researchers or range of salient disciplines to build connective tissue between and among them so as to one, better understand the origins and consequences of this gender digital divide, and two, intervene in its reproduction. Uh, Jen is currently co editor of Loading, the Journal of the Canadian Game Studies Association, and past president of the Canadian Games Studies Association. Uh, over a research career, Jen has completed two longitudinal studies of gender and digital gameplay and has recently completed the Veris project with SRA International. Uh, she has published widely on education, technology, gender, design and development of digital games, and technology policies and policy practices in K-12 school. She has considerable experience working on and with teachers in relation to technology, pedagogy, <coughs> and authored a report for the Ontario Ministry of Education entitled 21st Century Skills, Technology and Learning. She is co-editor of Rules and Play, International Perspectives, on digital game research by Susan Stout and lead author of policy on the plot. The title of the talk today, Feminist Bitches and Fucking Dice, Forging an Alliance in Digital Game Game Scholarship, which alludes to her recent work on the Feminist Games Project, as well as the improper misogynistic behaviors of game developers and gamers that represent violent, triolic, and built speech that can marginalize women as sexualized objects or ridicule them for speaking out. Some of the more profiled examples of recent years include the hate speech backlash to Ida Sarkeesian's Kickstarter campaign for Miss Frequencies that sought to make short videos on the tropes versus women's games. Uh, the number one reason why Twitter hashtag that opened up discussions about the heterogender norms and reinforced upon women and other marginalized groups such as the LGBTQ community and the gaming industry. And the flurry of resignations by Game Developer Association members, particularly Brenda Romero, who followed the Scent to Dress Dancers at one of the Game Developer Conference bodies this past March. And while these examples are some of the more explicit forms of misogyny in the gaming industry, there are also many subtle heteronormative elements entrenched in society and gaming culture that desperately need critical initiatives, such as feminists and games, to illuminate and intervene in their cultural reproduction. I'm looking forward to hearing some of Jen's research in this area and her considerable work and outreach to address these issues through productive forms of collaboration and activism. Please join me in giving Jen Jensen a little call. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Patrick, for the invite, and Leslie. Um, and uh, thanks also for uh, swearing, Chris. I appreciated that a lot. Um, I think maybe that I might take the prize for the um, worst or best title, depending on how you look at it. Um, and I'm really excited to be here uh, in this actually completely rocking series. Um, I should warn you right from the start that if you aren't familiar with digital game culture, uh, 
and even if you are somewhat, I'm going, what I'm going to present here today, as the title suggests, is not only in offensive, but it's also deeply toxic. Rehearsing just a sliver of that toxicity today, I'm extremely mindful of what Anne McClintock warns, that in this rehearsal, in some way, I practiced a kind of reenactment of the violent, hateful, and aggressive speech acts and actions that I'll take you through. While I struggle with that act of reenactment, I think also that all too often we are guilty of not making more public the, the acts of aggression that we experience every day as a result of patriarchy, misogyny, and homophobia. Everything that I will show you today is part of the public domain, as it were, so I'm not breaking any confidences nor outing anyone who is not already, in some sense, out. So uh, what am I going to do? I'm going to run you through, uh, starting with feminism, talking a little bit about precarity and why I think it's important here, um, uh, using that as a way into the circulation of power in relation to games, uh, talk to you about some of the ways that we can talk back, uh, some of the ways I'm problematizing and have been with Suzanne de Castell, the kinds of theories uh, that are circulating, especially in the game studies community around problems and issues and questions of gender and identity. Uh, and then talk to you a little bit about uh, the research that we've been doing for the past 10 years that tries from the start to make a difference. And then I'm gonna pitch to you a new direction, which we've been calling feminist forensics. So first, that's rather precarious, I hope, to start from the other way around. Uh, it's admittedly an odd coupling of words to put games and feminism in a sentence together, but the past two years especially have precisely reinforced the need for feminist activist work to mobilize and support women who both work in the industry and who are at the same time view themselves as a part of or residing on the margins of gaming's predominantly masculinized culture. In this talk, then, I'll detail the conditions of precarity that women face um, as uh, both marginal subjects in the video game industry and as sexualized objects in the creative and cultural products that the world's largest inter entertainment industry produces. I do so through the documentation of recent examples of violent, vitriolic, and hate-filled hate speech that has been targeted at women who have been either spoken out from these margins or have been singled out as an object of ridicule from within the industry's ranks. These examples demonstrate a form of extreme gender norm enforcement that I hope to show can be challenged through feminist activist work, including some, in, some beginning by the mainstream games industry, which Chris referred to, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So why precarity and why am I evoking that as a starting point for the analysis of policing gender and sexuality norms when it comes to video game makers and their players? Precarity, as Judith Butler points out, examines the lived conditions of populations who, quote, suffer from failing social and economic networks of support and become differently exposed to injury, violence, and death. In the case of video games as a cultural industry, which has been and continues to be economically supported by governments worldwide, it's, a population, uh, its population and those who consume its products are decidedly not those at risk of dying due to poor living conditions or starvation. However, this industry has produced subjects who are not only targets of violence and aggression, but who are afforded no institutional protection from those harms, either through the law or through their actual organizations, and have only very recently received any protection through grassroots counter-movements, which I'm going to describe. So I want to argue that positioning women as precarious subjects and objects in video game culture shifts the ground from the individual case of a single woman being harassed while speaking and playing in an online game, or when simply writing, blogging, or critiquing games, to a structural level that ties in with social and cultural gender norms, as well as with political and legal structures that have yet to come online to offer real protection for misogynistic hate speech. Butler argues that gender norms are very much tied to precarity, and that by extension the performance of gender norms, or not, are inseparable from the circulation of larger power dynamics. 
With reference to video game culture, the struggle over power and its maintenance can be seen to be happening, I, I think, three levels simultaneously. First, at the level of the individual game player, as women report being harassed regularly in online play and in the workforce. Second, at the level of game culture, as it is consumed and reproduced in games and through its players in online and offline spaces. And third, at the level of the state, which is both the state in terms of that which makes and enforces laws against hate speech and, harass and harassment, and the state in terms of software and systems that could be used to police individuals within games and or within public online spaces, like comment, se comment sections on blogs, YouTube, news websites, and the myriad of other kinds of anonymizing, unregulated virtual spaces in which whosoever will can communicate to a potentially global audience. So in the next section, I'm going to rehearse for some of you the well-trodden ground of gender and the masculine culture of gameplay uh, and narrow down on the second level, um, which is that culture, and then move on to the individual level as a more specific example. So we've actually inherited this issue from gender and technology studies more generally. Games are very much a technology that have their specific technicities. And we know from decades of research on gender and technology um, that we have basically three primary issues. Access, women and girls don't have access, unfettered hands-on access to technologies. Two, we simply don't have equitable relations in, uh, uh, in relation to technology. A great example of this is just in everyday school context. Um, it's always the boy who is the computer expert in the school still after all these years. Um, and then third, in terms of technological design, and we see this still, uh, programming and computer hardware for men and the softer skills like word processing and design for women. So this gets uh, well translated into the video games and uh, those kinds of technologies. Video games have been argued to be a gateway to careers in IT, but primarily for men. There are far f fewer girls and women playing a particular kinds of games, and I'll talk about that. And uh, we have this problem of technological design, which are girl games that I'll talk a little bit about. So, work on the masculinist culture of gameplay, the default presumption of the of gameplay game players in general is that you're a male, um, and even the mainstream is worried about how to get your girlfriend to play. I don't think that they mean my girlfriend, but they mean someone else's girlfriend. Um, marginalization of women, uh, fewer women producing and developing games, and we have this kind of pinkification. So this is one of my favorite slides made by Stephanie Fisher up here. We've worked together for eight or nine years now, and <laughs> she puts this really well. Um, in gaming culture, sex-based stereotypes are re routinely reinvoked in the service of policing a masculine culture, and it continues to be a, strug a struggle to examine and talk about females participation in gaming culture as equal members and not just as go girl gamers. Um, and that's in part because they are, they have PMS, <laughs> A. Um, and this is something that actually has been in circulation for a very long time. Um, as Judy Wiseman pointed out over 30 years ago um, in feminist construct, uh, Feminism Confronts Technology, hegemonic forms of masculinity shape the way in which we come to access and make use of these kinds of tools. Um, so in terms of Pinkified, this is what it looks like. Yep, babysitting mama, you would love to play that game. Uh, this is the Imagine series, uh, which is all about ice champions. Uh, this is a, a game that was made in the 1990s and redone by Silicon Sisters. It's for girls. Uh, called School 26. It sells very, very well in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> I won't say anything about that. So, the Games for Girls discourse is driven by a desire to figure out what women and girls want. So, for example, in a 1997 article, pioneer designer Brenda Laurel is reportedly to have confessed, quote, I agree with whatever solution the research suggested. I'd go along with it, even if it meant shipping products in pink boxes. So we ought not to be surprised that it is in pink boxes that girls have learned to package their desire. 
but such desires surely have far more to do with the gender identity development of adult males than with that of children themselves, since it is masculinity which has ever been the real respondent to the question of what both women and girls want. So my argument is for disenchantment and for the abandonment of a utopian landscape of desire which has never been anything but entrapment for women. And the question I urge simply is this, whose interests will be served in making use of these purportedly essential differences as a basis of creating girl-friendly games? Most importantly, are we producing games for girls or are we producing girls themselves by, as Alice Luzer would put it, 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 interpolating desire to become the girl by playing with girlish toys, learning thereby to become the kind of woman she was always already destined to become. And that would feel to some of you very much like Rousseau's Sophie. Um, so in terms of, that was the pinkification. Uh, now we're going to marginalization, uh, ghettoization of female players. Uh, women, we know, uh, because of the Entertainment Software Association statistics, that they've been playing games in roughly equal number to men since 2003. And yet, in 2013, they came out with the, almost exactly the same statistic and said, look, women are playing more games. The statistics match. Um, what's interesting is that uh, usually women play more casual mobile games, and we have the kind of more traditional, hardcore male players. So we have the kind of ghettoization of women by both mainstream research of this kind, um, but also uh, very much um, in terms of the ways in which uh, in, uh, things are marketed, et cetera. And this really is about status migration. Uh, we know very much in other careers like medicine that as soon as women entered uh, to be general practitioners, pediatricians, um, gyne, anything like that, the salaries actually go down. They've been going down for the last 20 years. Um, so as soon as women kind of exceed men in any area, including something like this, their status, the status of, of being in that, that area or participating in that area decreases. So moving from marginalization to sexualization, this is just really obvious, so I'm really not going to spend time on this. Um, <laughs> we also have exclusion. Uh, and these are uh, basically uh, a YouTube channel that is arguing against uh, the exclusion, uh, exclusion of women and challenging the normative presumption that girls and women do not play. Um, this is also puts them in precarious positions as they are often targets for misogynistic remarks or sexualized discourse. They're even harassed on the YouTube channel uh, if you read the comments. Um, so this is really very much where they talk about being ganged up on or attacked, et cetera. Um, and just as a, a little warning, the next part I'm going to go into is where it gets a little bit ugly and then we'll come back out. So this is next to the deeply harassing bit. Uh, these are publicly available examples of online harassment in a blog like Fatogly or Slutty. It's been around for quite a long time. You can look it up since 2011. Uh, it's a shame the Johns project where female gamers submit details and screenshots of the sexualized misogynistic hate speech that they receive when playing in online spaces. Um, the posts mainly come from Xbox, uh, Xbox Live, uh, but also massively multiplayer online games. Uh, male players in these games sometimes react to female transgressors in ways and with words that are much less acceptable in real life scenarios. So uh, part of what this is framed as is, can't you take a fucking joke? Um, and I want to turn from these kind of more quotidian experience of Xbox Live players uh, to talk more specifically about two very public cases of harassment, one that is ongoing um, and the other uh, that uh, very much kind of made an impact in the games industry. <coughs> So this is on the level of culture. Uh, as Chris mentioned, uh, the number one reason why you wouldn't want to be a woman in the games industry is a Twitter hashtag that went viral last year. And people weighed in. And actually, they're still using the hashtag. So they, they continue to weigh in about this. Um, and, uh, and many, many, many of the comments were 
because it's unsafe, because I'm harassed, because people pass over me, because I'm not listened to, etc. In response to that, there was a really fantastic panel at GDC um, and another Twitter hashtag, the number one reason to be uh, women in the games industry. And it had all these great people, Lee Alexander, Maddie Bryce, Robin Hunicki, um, Brenda Romera, et cetera. Uh, and Lee Alexander actually gave, uh, you can read a kind of not quite transcribed um, version of her talk on Gema Sutra. And she gave this really impassioned talk about why the industry needs to change, about how you might be, go about doing that, about her experiences in the industry, et cetera. All these fantastic women talked. And they were talking to an audience that mostly was like this. Um, but people were still very much impassioned. Um, and then everyone went to the after party. Um, and it turned out that they had scantily clothed women. And people were really offended because part of the sponsoring organization was the International Game Developers Association. Um, and they had done the same thing the year before and the year before and the year before, and people were sick of it. So Brenda Romero, who's here, uh, was on the board. She quit, and then other people, two people quit, actually. Um, and the, the other sponsoring organization was Zen Yeti, uh, who, who publicly said uh, they didn't see anything wrong with it. The people that they had chosen were gamers. Uh, so that's one at the level of kind of industry. Going down to the level of individual is Anania Sarkeesian. Um, she decided that she wanted to get some money to basically on Kickstarter to do a few videos uh, that critiqued the role of gender in video games. Um, and uh, her, her Kickstarter got picked up by Fortran and uh, Reddit. And um, basically, she had her Wikipedia page taken down. She was harassed. Uh, on phone, she had pizzas sent to her parents' house. She had all kinds of terrible things happen to her, um, including a, a nice young Canadian who decided it would be very, very funny to make up a beat up the Anita Sarkeesian game. Um, his name is Ben Spur, and he was outed by feminist blogger Steph Guthrie. Um, so, this is a really kind of ongoing problem. Um, Anita is still harassed. Uh, and I just wanted to show you a little bit about w why she becomes precarious and why she is precarious in a position of precarity is because she actually is asking for space to critique games and to say, look, can't we make better female characters? Why do we make such shitty games? But she can't do that because she's female. And I just wanted you to see a little bit about how deeply offensive this is. <coughs> Yeah, that one's tough, isn't it? So, uh, yeah, a brilliant series if you haven't seen it. Uh, she has a really good uh, uh, episode that's on violence uh, and women in, in video games. Um, and uh, she, has, she is still uh, very much the subject and object of hate-filled speech. So moving from Anita, to a very recent public case of a female game designer who was harassed over Facebook by a male journalist. In an interview where the person harassed did not use her new, real name, she stated, quote, why would a woman want to talk about abuse and harassment in an environment where her harassers are staff on game websites and her peers are jockeying for the same job as hers? That's one powerful dynamic to contend with. That 
is sort of uh, compounded by a very prominent res uh, response by a very prominent de game developer. This dude made something called God of War, uh, who basically said she's partially to blame. Okay, so, and this is public discourse on a subject that actually need not have that kind of discourse surrounding it. Um, so, in recounting these kind of individual cases, there are many, many others too numerous to recount in a talk, um, like this case of Jennifer Hepler of then Bioware, who was also publicly harassed and threatened because she had an opinion about video games. I think we need to understand and to demonstrate how these individual cases are epiphenomenal to a larger structural issue that enfranchises a male stream of gamers and others to denigrate and abuse women who dare to play and worse yet to make video games. That's not to say that these cases can be taken to represent all women, far from it. They are, on the face of it, all heterosexual and Sarkeesian is an attractive photogenic young woman, characteristics that hardly position her or them outside of mainstream gender norms. Indeed, it is interesting precisely that these kinds of gender typicalities of these cases that both spark and fuel the disciplinary apparatus of normalized misogyny and heteronormativity. What is correlatively significant about these stories then is that they reveal the ways in which the state does little or nothing to put a stop to date and rape threats and hate and maligning speech. This is accomplished not so much by addressing these wayward individuals, but by publicly denouncing the ways that these otherwise worthy women have broken the unwritten laws of gender, addressing more paradigmatically women in general with what amounts to, under most criminal clothes, to slander. And yet systems like YouTube that are fantastic at pulling content for copyright violations seem un unable, aka unwilling, to do anything to put a stop to these vile and violent speech acts. They remain online to continually reassault their readers. Part of the discourse that has been mobilized to oppose blocking hate speech at a systems level is that such a move violates freedom of speech legislation. In the US, a, constitution, a constitutional amendment that is cited most, almost as frequently as the right to bear arms, even in the face of a massive innocent, innocent lives lost to that freedom, is the right to freedom of speech. What is continually misapprehended about the right to free speech is that it is, all, it is and always has been subject to limitations. It is not within one's right to verbally harm someone, for example, through slander or libel or hate speech. John Stuart Mill argued strongly against the suppression of opinion in On Liberty and the presumption that opinions were to be publicly aired, that they might be debated, was key to his thinking on free speech. M Mill's primary concern was about an individual's right to speak back against government, that is, not to have opinions suppressed because they disagreed with those in power. This is very different from someone claiming their right to salacious and vitriolic hate speech, especially when that speech is directed against those structurally, and structurally subordinated in positions of lesser power than the speaker. So like governments that both defend and restrict free speech, Mill too set limits against doing harm to others through speech. And in his value of open discussion or the airing of opinions, Mill shared the presumption of his era that speaker and address C were co-located in space and time, that the interlocutors shared a regional context, that they in effect knew one another, and that in this co-inhabitation, they publicly stood by their opinions. That is precisely what is not the case with much of the online harassment I've showed you here. Typically, the most crass and sexualized comments are posted anonymously and or through fake email and Twitter accounts. So to be very clear, nowhere in the principle of free speech is it within one's right to slander or malign publicly and without proof another person, nor is it within one's right to make threatening phone calls, hack websites, threaten to kill or rape another person. None of these things are defensible by the principle of freedom of speech. Indeed, 
Quite to the contrary, they are prohibited by it. So what I'd like to do for a moment is to suspend business as usual and to refuse the notion that everything is fine. Frigga Haug and colleagues some time ago wrote about the fact that we actually actively support these kinds of contradictions by not seeing them. And this, in fact, makes it difficult to imagine different kinds of futures. It especially makes it difficult to imagine those futures when we can't remember the past. That we've been, <laughs> this is not a new issue. We've been here, done that, continue to do it. When it, women have been actively and violently prevented from enjoying equal opportunities in every field that matters for not just decades, but for millennia. And this is Catherine Schweitzer who uh, ran in the Boston Marathon, but she wasn't allowed. So one of the things that I think we really need to stop doing in research and in the ways that we write on these topics is assume that we know some kind of inner truth about gender. Gender, uh, we've known this for a long time, and we write it, is an enactment a performance that changes with context, with different people, uh, with speech acts, etc. So in game studies, and I'm going to just talk for a minute what I th what Suzanne and I actually have talked about um, is a real problem, and that Patrick, we talked about this morning, uh, which you called stenciling in theory. Uh, in game studies, we have seen altogether too much work that resurrects and redeploys traditional theories that have been critiqued and repudiated, for example, traditional gender theories that have been considered and rejected by feminist scholarly work. Their ongoing deployment within game studies is what contributes to the resilience of familiar stories about girls' sociality, their dislikes of competition and, and gameplay that smacks of violence, and their disinterest in and expending time and effort improving their technical skills and abilities. These accounts continue to invoke traditional gendered roles and expectations as if these roles and expectations were constraints which girls just normally and naturally conform to. So we see this reversion to traditional gender role theory and for example, Dimitri Williams and colleagues' resurrection of Chaudhary's early 90s gender role theory as a framework within which to report findings on gender in massively more multiplayer online games. And they argue that there is a need to develop gender role theory by contributing data on contemporary digital leisure-based activities. And I quote, gender role theory should be used to drive more generalizable methodologies, end quote. But why? What is sacrosanct about gender roles and expectations that we should bolster it with new data and apply it more widely? We know this doesn't work. Um, so although they speak of of, quote, refining the theory to better account for shifting gender player actions and beliefs, no such refinement actually happens. Instead, that theory is deployed as if it were a set of facts that their data needed to be fit into. Shortly thereafter, they refer to a talk about applying gender role theory to massively multiplayer online games, a more accurate representation of the regressive theoretical moves they are making. To be sure, we can certainly use traditional theories in which conventional gender roles are axiomatic presuppositions and a rare findings deductively around them, relying on survey and server-side data rather than engaging and observing directly as alongside our research subjects over time. It is easy enough to overlook the possibilities, for example, in doing it that way that girls are reluctant to play competitively because they might be actively ridiculed and bullied when they do. Girls are not born supportive and reticent. These are things they learn, often reluctantly and often, and often by force. Gender role theory applied to survey data actually gives us no way to encounter information of this kind, nor does it support any inquiry concerning outliers, like men who prefer supportive roles or women who love first-person shooters, keeping inquiries safely bounded within the hegemonic mainstream. We already know very well indeed that girls' and women's engagement with digital games will demonstrate all the familiar patterns and characteristics that, that have been noted since the earliest work on this topic, so long as we do nothing to address inequalities. But why would we want to do that? 
for we will by that means find out nothing new that way and nothing that can call into question the rightness of maintaining inequitable conditions for girls and women. What such a theoretical tendency does in fact precisely the opposite and entrenches hegemonic gender roles even more firmly and bolsters them with recent research as it finds necessarily will do because of the theoretical apparatus it uses and revives. And, and we all had to s sort of survive this Venus thing. And this is a brand new book on warriors and warriors in exactly the same vein. And I bet you can't guess who the warriors are. <laughs> it's like so surprising. <laughs> um, so <laughs> what we've been trying to do in our work is to uh, pay careful attention to the lived experiences of players in order to generate new theory in a relatively new field for a new time. Um, and I think some of the ways that we're doing that is uh, basically by redesigning uh, what is uh, the status quo hegemonic gender order uh, and turning the usual accounts that girls don't like competition and that they eschew violent games into something that is actually more interesting, that they, given time and energy and the resources, they do want to play those games. And we've been doing that specifically through a feminist intervention framework. And partly, actually, because, as Raymond Connell so neatly does it uh, in the update to gender in World Perspective, that gender difference research has time and time again actually proven to be gender similarity research. So rather than rehearse those same kinds of things again and again, this is not true, um, we, we might move on to see what kinds of things become more interesting. So what we've been doing is uh, to change directions. This is uh, work from Diane Carr um, and uh, her work and from other colleagues makes it clear that when you study the context of play, and you see the kind of hold that context has on what people do, it is possible to see that what people prefer changes very much with that context. For us, on our own running of the video game club over eight years in the greater Toronto area, we found out that when we changed those contexts of play with all girls playing and female mentors, we were able to show how changes to the assemblage of the research site resulted in girls playing very much like the boys. It also meant that we were able to see how and in what ways facts about gender, and this is facts like that uh, in other research as well, were actually facts about novice players. So in other words, when girls became more skilled, their preferences, attitudes, and play styles changed. And we see this in a lot of research that uh, lines boys and girls up and say, oh look, the girls, they." They just play differently. Well, they haven't played games. Of course they play differently. So we have literature-wide this intense conflation. Um, so we were able to actually carry this work on long enough that we reproduced it in different sites in very different contexts of play. And we're able to show that actually a lot of what people were looking at as facts about gender were facts about um, uh, about novice players, and we reproduced that in the, in the boys. <laughs> so once we had novice boys, they actually played very much like the girls. Uh, so it's not acceptable, we argue in this work, to keep finding out facts about girls and gameplay or boys and gameplay that repeat the same kinds of generalizations that have been produced over the last two and a half decades. We need to find things that surprise us so that we can be confident that the work we are doing is actually um, basically uh, making a difference in some way. Um, and work that I think is starting to make a difference is the work that we've been doing for the last couple of years that, that as Chris said, that we got uh, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council funding for. Our idea here was to basically get together a group of people who were very much interested in thinking about feminism um, and what it could do for the games community. Um, and what we wanted to do also was to document and then deconstruct what Garfinkel called degradation um, and oppression because it makes possible to mobilize against it and create strategies to contest it 
actively intervene and begin to change it. As Garfinkel puts it, quote, a communicative work between persons whereby the public identity of an actor is transformed into something looked on as lower in the local scheme of social types will be a status, will be called a status degradation ceremony. So some years ago, a social sciences researcher concluded that from examining a range of cases within an inequitable social system, the best opportunities to advance gender equity are when the system breaks, when business as usual goes awry, and we argue that that's exactly what is happening now. We're broken. I, those examples show that. Um, so we got a whole bunch of people together. We talked about what it meant to be inclusive, um, how we could strategize about an explicitly feminist agenda. And um, we uh, did that in Toronto, where we had a group of people who were not sure that feminism could speak to the issues or, or the problems that they were having at that time. Uh, and uh, we rinsed and repeated that in, uh, in Vancouver about 18 months later after seed funding a number of projects that I'll talk to you about. And when we came back together, we had a room full of way more people than we had uh, in Toronto, including allies, people in the industry, students, et cetera. Uh, and when one of our colleagues who had done the same thing the year before, and about half of us put up our hands if, if the, we were feminists, everyone in their, that room put up their hand that they were a feminist. And for us, that kind of groundswell made a big difference. And how we know it made a big difference is that Anita Sarkeesian also brought some of her really lovely followers um, to our event online. And there is a video produced by Dildo Faggins. Uh, it's still in circulation and being commented on. And I just thought I'd show, it's quite long, but I thought I'd, sh and, and by the way, Dildo Faggins wasn't there. Um, but I thought I'd show you his uh, critique. Anita Sarkeesian recently released part two of Tricks vs. Women, and this video has absolutely nothing to do with that. Instead, it's going to be more about a gaggle fuck of feminist followers who are currently circled jerking away at a feminist in gaming conference, or FIG 2013 as they call it. So, what have we seen from this event so far? Well, absolutely nothing, to be painfully and brutally honest. And you see, I thought the whole point of this social justice movement was to create dialogue on certain topics, and this will somehow change societal behaviors. For this theory to work, there has to be some form of dialogue to begin with, and from the feminist in gaming conference, the only dialogue that's coming out of the event is normally in the form of short quotes, followed by the event hashtag. It probably would have made more sense to have some form of live stream up, but that would have been a logical thing to do, so we can't have that, can we? When I suggested on Twitter that having a live stream may have been a good idea, one of the people attending the event responded by saying, why are you so threatened? Grow up. People have different opinions, and it's okay. When I called the event Feminism Circle Joke 2013, Andrew Grant Wilson responded by saying, women must really threaten you. Your life must be very scary. <laughs> if only you knew my deepest fears. Apparently, feminist circle jerks were his deepest. I don't even know. We, we still talk about what does that actually look like, but it's okay. <laughs> I'll just leave that to your own imagination. <laughs> so, as part of FIG, we help support uh, Dames Making Games, which you've already heard about uh, in the form of cash and... Uh, and uh, uh, some uh, computers, ongoing technical support and technological support. Um, we shipped off the model that, that Dames Making Games was using to Montreal, um, and uh, they ran their own incubator uh, with their own particular uh, and different folks, and they just are running their second one uh, uh, just now. Actually, it's happening right now. And we had a third incubator uh, that was Double X Games in the UK that spun off a whole bunch of other stuff as well. So we had um, a whole lot of, I would say, even ground swell um, of, of interest, of work that, that is continuing. Um, and uh, that's sort of what's leading us to try to get more funding uh, to be able to continue this kind of work and to really intervene. Um, in the status quo, and I think that the challenge that we face as feminists, activists, and community organization is of, of inventing equity of, that, of this kind, and that means telling stories of women who do not fit the established gender, gender scripts. In some sense, we haven't yet accomplished that ourselves. 
uh, the women who are at the center of the stories I've told you here too readily fit into kind of heteronormative gender categories. Um, but, as Butler puts it, they are notable precisely because they already count as noteworthy subjects. They are recognizable as female, whether as attractive young women or as university professors or students. And it is from that position of, of a recognizable subject that Butler ties performativity to precarity. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of time to read this. So often the folks that are getting the most media attention aren't, aren't the ones that, who are kind of on the far side of the established modes of intelligibility. We, know, we sort of in some sense can recognize them. Nor do their individual subjectivities, their embodied personalities challenge openly or otherwise establish gender stereotypes. But as illegitimated, illegitimated speaking subjects, they are able to deploy that agency to open up the misogynist world of video games to gamers and non-gamers. And from that enfranchised position, and I think this is an enfranchised position that we have it uh, through FIG, through Dames Making Games, through Pixels, et cetera, um, uh, to, to actually speak and to pow more powerfully, in some sense, challenge the masculinist um, status quo. So as far as games go then, uh, as I've said, women are told time and again we don't belong publicly and privately. However, there are folks here in Toronto and elsewhere that are having an impact, and I'll just shout out to a couple of them really quickly here. Anna Anthropy, trans game designer, look her up. Maddie Bryce, same, very different, doing fantastic work. Samantha Allen, critique um, on Border House and other blogs. She rocks, and she just got a vagina. Um, which is so great. So we have people who are doing um, all kinds of work and work that is making an impact. Uh, so what I've tried to show is, sort of to round this out, is how grassroots activists, individuals, and groups have begun to push back effectively against the misogyny and violence that game culture and the industry have for too long supported. This work has begun to shake loose the reign of ludolog ludological libertarianism that uncritically pronounces hate speech as just fun and games and has drawn attention to the need for political, social, technological, and economic responsibility in the future. The fact that even our best intention practices are themselves implicated and enmeshed in the very gender orders that need overturning make gender reform very much work against the grain, even if in our most progressive organizations. This is not easy work. It's very difficult work to do, and it's work where all the time you have to remind yourself why you're doing it. Activism demands not just stellar individuals and isolated success stories, but the concerted collective work of ordinary people for which a community, some kind of critical mass, remains for women an absolute necessity if in both industry and, and the academy we are to change the conditions of our work and our know-how. In Toronto, we are beginning to have that, that kind of public and brave work, um, including folks like Steph Guthrie, Dames Making Games, Kara Stone, Emily Westcott, Hannah Epstein, Alex Lee, Steph Fisher, Kelly Bergstrom, Phelan Parker, Rachel Murr, and Suzanne de Castell, to name just a few. To move forward, I'm going to come back to feminism. It has a lot to teach, and not just to women. And Suzanne and I have written about this as a kind of feminist forensics, a public hearing on where responsibility resides for the formation and preservation of gender-based disadvantage and exclusion. This means doing more responsible research from a feminist perspective, that understanding and documenting these conditions is not enough, not just how did this happen, but how to change it. Because the situation of persistent gender inequality is not a manifestation or a reflection of God's will or nature's intelligent design, rather, or uh, warriors and warriors. Rather, these differences are mutable. They have been made, and they can be changed. They can be unmade, and they can be remade differently. That means bringing both critique and politics into our discussions. It entails discerning and disclosing responsibility, public accountability, and intervention. For me, that also 
means turning our focus to our own academic practices, where we suck, by the way, um, and revealing where and how they work to reinforce precisely what we have here been trying to dismantle. And there's a really lovely new paper that Phelan pointed out to me that I think does this feminist forensic works. Um, and it's Nuni's paper just published in Game Studies. It's a beautiful piece of work. She calls it archaeologies, but whatever. So here we go, conclusion. Ever since Simone de Beauvoir's classic ex exposition of the entrenched secondary character of women's gendered subjectivity, it has been apparent that the subject of human communication has been sexed and gendered as masculine. The generic masculine subject in grammar, the understood and taken for granted masculine subject of literature, and the constitution of the human individual as male in politics, law, and ownership of property has been critiqued and interrogated through many waves of feminist theory. Given that we have seen the predominance and taken for grantedness of the male subject in and through every kind of medium, it is and should be surprising to create conditions that run counter to this predominance, that indeed interrupt our expectations of gender roles and gendered interests. This means, I think for us, not being content to amass descriptions of how dreadful things are and finding or devising explanations of existing states of affairs, but to discern the validity basis for such explanations and to interrogate the way things are so as to effectively improve what have been for far too long persistent and resilient structures that position women as precarious subjects of gender-based disadvantage, subordination, and inclusion, or and exclusion, and to overturn them now. Methodologically, what my colleagues and I have been working hard to do is to give surprise itself a speaking role in our research. Thus, if we are not surprised at the outcomes of our interventions in the gender order, then we can deduce with some assurance that we are working not to undermine the secondary status of women and girls, but indeed to reinforce it. Surprise is the canary in our mining operation, and if it's not seen, we are in deep gender trouble. Thank you. I've actually been thinking about this a lot lately, and uh, I think you definitely touched on it definitely at the end of your talk. Um, and I just want to curious about your opinion on it. Um, a lot of it just has to do with um, trying to bring up these issues into the classroom, mm -hmm. right? And I mean, I, I come from an academic perspective where, I mean, I was very much just undergoing a lot of liberal feminist ideals where it's like, you know, men can be feminists and everyone's a feminist, so it's great. Um, and then there's also now lots of ally talk, right? Where maybe it's better to describe yourself as an ally, mm -hmm. right? Than to just come into a specific position and be like, hey, I'm a male feminist. Also, particularly for me, because I've had difficulty doing it with an academic perspective, because I'm really, really uncomfortable getting in front of a classroom and telling younger women what they should think about feminism. Because also, like, I mean, the whole idea of hegemonic masculinity kind of, you know what I mean, can kick in there. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about your perspective on that issue. Or is it not an issue? Should it not matter? Or um, I mean, it always, in some sense, the way that I would approach that is always with care, in, in just the ways that you just described. Um, not presuming that you know what feminism is, not presuming that, what you, that you know what it might mean to those young women. For me, um, in my own teaching practice, what I find is that people don't really know anything about it. They've, they haven't read. They don't know what it means. They know that it's a bad word. It's a really bad word. And you don't want anyone to call you that. And uh, certainly not your boyfriend, because oh my god. Um, so so I, not to be facetious, but I think that that is something that we have to do a little bit more, uh, a better job at, is to help people find ways in. Um, and I don't think the ways in are always the same. So I'll give you an anecdote um, by way of answering your question, which is to say, I just continue on doing it exactly how you're doing it. Um, when we were recruiting to go to the next stage for uh, Feminists and Games Part 2, which means applying for a full partnership grant, which is killing me. It's due next week. Um, uh, I had met er early on um, this young computer scientist, youngish, um, who uh, was great. She was super nice. Uh, and we started our phone call. And she's like, first up, just let you know, I'm not a feminist. I'm so not. A and I said, OK, well, I'll tell you a little bit about why, you know, why that and what we're doing. 
And we talked on and she said, I, you know, I really find that, that it just doesn't help anyone, et cetera, et cetera. So I, we didn't need to agree on feminism. So I, I kind of recruited her. She wasn't super interested the first time around. A whole year and a half go by. I meet her for coffee to say, hey, you want to sign up for part two? And she said, yeah, I'd love to. And I thought, wow, she didn't hesitate. And I didn't get the, I'm not a feminist. And then she started talking and she said, I actually just went through a very big year of change. Um, I realized that I had been a programmer my whole life and that I was always the exception and that I had a lot of programming privilege and that I was actually sort of projecting this onto my students, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Long story short was that she actually did a 180 completely and saw that feminism was really important for her, for her life, and for her teaching practice. So I don't think we can like shove it down people's throats, but we can show, talk to them about it, show them how it might work, those kinds of things. Um, and I think sometimes people need time to come back around to how that would be meaningful to them, especially when you're talking about young people who don't see that, or even other folks, they don't have to be young, who, who don't see that these are structural problems. They're not, as I said, problems of individuals. I'm just wondering if you see any recent changes in attitudes towards the word. And the reason I'm querying that is that I teach in a program that's on exclusively for women, or not for women, but it attracts women, which is fiber. Mm -hmm. And lately, I think it's the last two years or so, I've been very surprised that the young women previously to this that had always been the, you know, I'm not a feminist and that kind of discussion. In the last two years, there's been something different happening. Uh, women, uh, or these young women, seem to be taking it on and using the word and kind of tossing it around a bit more. So I just wondered if you noticed that. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I wish I could say that I'd observed that. I've read about it, <laughs> like in the UK. Um, I haven't necessarily observed that. I, I find that people, um, that I get a lot of confessionals, like about why not, or, or that they don't really understand. Um, I, I think it's terrific that that's been your observation. Um, I do work with a different group of folks, so I work with people who tend to be more conservative and, uh, and who are teachers, and so that's a very, that is very much like them saying fuck in a classroom, I find. That feminism is, is a very difficult speech act, um, not always, uh, but I haven't, I haven't yet experienced that kind of, I would love to, <laughs> but I haven't, I haven't heard it with my own ears. I've just read about yeah, it. Now you've read about it. Yes, I have, okay. yeah. <laughs> like hate crime violence of video games means something to me because um, I actually had friends that run a plan and one of them murdered the other one who's my best friend. And he sort of epitomized, you know, the rage quitter. Yeah. And I'm sure that he's someone that would have been messaging in boxes with anything and everything that, that would be sort of constitute a sort of hatred. Um, I'm just wondering when you say that most of these comments are anonymous so you can't really trace back to anybody, are there any studies that sort of go out looking for people that are willing to sort of talk about, yes, I, you know, I, I approach video games this way and I feel it's justified or, you know, I feel guilty about it but I'm willing to talk about it, you know? Right, actually, I, I, they're not all anonymous. A lot, a lot of them are connected to real people's Twitter, uh, you know, identities, their real life identities. So there are, there are very public cases of um, prominent women who've been harassed over the last year um, where Twitter has basically had to give up um, uh, th those people's identities in order for there to be some kind of police involvement. So that certainly happened. Um, in terms of uh, that happening specifically in, uh, in gaming communities, not so much, it's way more difficult. Um, there is a, a, a blog by a woman uh, who, it's called Not in the Kitchen, and she plays on Xbox Live a lot, and she was trying to get someone banned, and it took her like three months just to get someone banned. But so. were there ever interviews with 
these yeah. offenders? Like, are they? Do they ever? Are, are there any studies where, where they're interviewed? And well, the, they talk about why they justify. Yes. Yeah, so the guy who this guy, he his real name is up here. Um, where is he? He said he was drunk. <laughs> this guy. Uh, the, he was Facebook messaging. Yeah, so he said he was drunk and he's depressed and, you know, that's no excuse. He did sort of write, he didn't quite apologize. He, he sort of said, well, you know, I was badly behaved. I'm really sorry. So there's that. Yeah. Sorry, uh, okay. You said any arcade guy who constantly Yeah, that's right. Apologizing, dismissing is not okay. Yeah. It's barely interesting. Right. Okay. Yeah, what's his name? I can't remember. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I mean, it's it's a kind of dismissal a but lot is of there times any too. Theorizing on sort of causes and triggers. No, not really at the moment. I mean, a lot of the causes are your female. That's the deepest underlying cause here <laughs> that we've been talking about. That you start there, and then it gets bad. So my question is a bit selfish. It's about uh, methods. Mm -hmm. I, I found very interesting sort of comments that you made about uh, should we aim for research methods to attain more generalized ability? Mm -hmm. And you, bring, you brought the case of um, no, we don't, because precisely the very individual cases can show specific patterns, individual cases that show uh, it showed the issue that it hasn't been visible right. precisely because of the research, research right. instruments that we have. Right. So, so with that context, I, I am now trying to wrestle with the literature in literature. Mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and I've seen a sort of very interesting strategy similar to what, what you have been doing in work, um, that you might be familiar with in neo literacy studies or in mm -hmm. um, genes key and so on. So, so how do you, what, what are you sort of thought of this? methodological strategies for information science to study this research, this phenomenon that involves especially the DIY movement or this major very, very short term interventions or interaction like I've seen you doing analysis of chatting. Yeah. So where are your thoughts? So my okay, so I have a few. Um, let me start with that. I think that the value of the work that, that we've been doing is that we don't do snapshots. So we're not going in and observing a five-week maker thing. Um, we're looking at, for example, 10 five-week maker things over time. We're in schools over a long period of time so that we see people change. We see how they change given different conditions or who they're playing with, how they're playing. So um, I think that my argument would be for methods that are slower, where we're not doing big data grabs, um, where we're not actually feeling like we're rushed all the time. Um, and I say that because I think that it actually produces really, really interesting work at the end of the day, because you're able to s sort of say how you thought at the beginning this person was this way, but it actually turns out that you know, they were having a really crappy life at home, and then as soon as that stopped, they were like little stars, you know, Sally won the best paper of the day or whatever. So, so I think that's one thing. Um, the other thing that has been really useful to us is uh, just using actor network theory because it so allows you to trace um, those, uh, well, first of all, it gives technology a kind of equal footing with all the other actants. And then it allows you to trace through those networks of connections um, to figure out at any given time. Now it has problems and you know, those are to do with uh, uh, hierarchies and politics and stuff. But you can, it's not, you don't have to always flatten it out. You can make it 3D <laughs> so you can see it differently. So I'd say that's the second thing. And then I think the third thing in terms of um, directly related to multimodality and multiliteracies um, and multilingualness um, is that what, what we've been trying to do is to have more than two channels. So a lot of times multimodal work is just text and image. Um, and I think games give you a really great platform to having 
3D image, text, sound, and that sort of thing. Um, and to turn that around, um, to not necessarily have people play, but to have them make, and to have them make games and kids. Um, because there's a whole other literacy we haven't gotten at, and that's the, you know, that's the computer, and I'd say computational literacy that a lot of people in this room would have very much benefited from. Sandra and I were talking about it. It'd be nice that you just grew up programming so you didn't have to think about it at the end of the day. Right? And I also think about games like uh, League of Legends where they're using the tribunal system and yeah. reporting and positive reinforcement to curb these type of I think it's some of the most interesting, I mean that's the most interesting system we have. It's a tribunal system, you can report people that you go to a, a jury, um, the, I mean, it's doing the work that it's actually working. And the cool thing about it is that people can ask to be blocked so that they can't say bad things. And a lot of people who kept getting kicked out ask to be blocked so that they're not continually getting kicked out, which is a really interesting reversal. I think they're kind of at the leading edge of some of that. But LOL has a female player base of 2% max. So, I mean, we're, they're policing other kinds of things there. So I wanted to ask you that you very briefly touched on sort of the, the politics of response mm -hmm. from the industry and the general regulation and so on, and compared it, for instance, to YouTube, right. taking down stuff that's a breach of copyright. And can you say a little bit more about that? Because what you, what you looked at, which I thought was some great interventions that going after individual right. you know, people who are just only music, but what about are there any examples of? There's not a lot of structural response. Um, a great example or, is that um, uh, Anita Sarkeesian did a TED talk, and uh, right away they pulled the comments. And sh basically, she's the only person who doesn't have comments on her TED talk. OK, so that's a good example. Um, uh, the League of Legends example is great because it's at a systems level. Um, but it also allows for the players to self-report, so they're not always, like, it's not taking person power all the time uh, because of the system that they set up. Um, and I'd say the third thing is, is that ex uh, Microsoft keeps threatening that they're going to do something, but they've done fuck all. Um, and I don't think that they really are going to do anything because it, it would take some, some kind of structural uh, at the level of software change in order to do it. Um, and because the reporting takes so long, it's, it's terrible. Like you can't necessarily get someone banned like that. Um, and a lot of these kinds of things, like I didn't show it, but a lot of this stuff also comes with like really nice pornographic images along with it. Um, so yeah, not nice. Following so, up on that a little bit, yeah. uh, there's, there's also this way that you can't talk about this, right. that there was a hoo-ha about work. <laughs> and when, uh, and, you know, I tried to publish something in one of my first papers was on uh, Friday. Yeah. You know, and I, so this is what they say. And the editors were like, well, look, you know, I can't support here. Um, and, uh, and when even uh, similarly, like the most violently homophobic yeah. um, legislation, all, you can't say cocksucker. Right. You know, right. you can't say cock, that's the other thing. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know. You can do whatever you want to right. do cocksuckers. Right. Um, so I just I, that's yeah. I just wonder what, what you what what do you do that? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I agree. I I'm glad that the title caused a hoopla. Um, you know, and I think that sometimes what happens. A lot of this stuff actually has gotten some more press over the last two years. It's much less underground than it used to be. Uh -huh. The trouble is, is that even though it's a little bit more out in the open, if you unfortunately read the comments, most of what the reaction is is like, get over it. Yeah. This is what games are about. You, you know, come on, grow up, grow a pair. You know, those kinds of things. I always say I have a pair. I don't know what you're talking about. But you know, th that kind of discourse sort of levels it off. And where it comes out is, it's really interesting because GDC is coming up. And the women's, Women in Games is uh, just an organization with women in the title that brings groups of women together. Um, but they have a, a little uh, listserv 
And on that list over the last few days has been circulating, should we do some action? What kind of action do we want to do? Do we want to stage a walkout, all this stuff? And a lot of the in-between commentary is, well, we don't want to make people feel bad. We don't want to jeopardize our jobs. Um, you know, why do we have to do something so public, et cetera? So there's also this place where it almost feels like um, we've lost the, the kind of ability to feel like we're entitled to fight back, that we're just supposed to, be, you know, take this. Um, and so I think fighting back is saying bad words like cocksucker and, you know, all those kinds of things and, and actually reclaiming them uh, so that they're not being deployed always towards us. My question is more about how to get folks in the world thinking. If you had mentioned in a study somewhere that there's a lot of Surrounded with, but the girls playing a female men for us. And I was wondering if you knew whether like, that kind of environment makes more of a difference, or even just how women and girls are represented in games. Like, if it's predominantly male characters, that you think that makes a difference for the female players, or even if they know that there's a woman designing the game, or those two choices, the men creating it. So, I know less about designing, um, but I will say so, there's a few things. One is that I'm, you know, and I made this point earlier today that if we rely on more women making all of our media, we're doomed because they're not making TV, they're not making film. Like, you know, we know this. So um, I think the 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 thing that we do is we make these situations girls and women only to start. That's an explicit focus, and we have female mentors. Um, and we allow them to play around in these spaces until they skill up. And then you invite the boys back in or the men back in. But that female-only space matters a whole lot for people who um, have felt uncomfortable about their technological skill in the past or who really have never had a controller in their hands. A lot of the girls don't. So that makes a really big difference. Um, and I mean, the main thing is, is it's not about interest. Um, we, in relation to technology in general, uh, choice in relation to computer technology is no choice for girls and women. They're not going to choose. So you have to put it in front of them and you have to say, play, make, do this stuff. And they do. They do play. Um, and, they, and they trash talk after a while. And, you know, and then they sound worse than the boys. The step knows <laughs> so bad. This is like so embarrassing. We, we made them bad. Um, so it's, it, but I really think, even though it makes people uncomfortable, that um, that women only, girl only space to start is very, very, very important. It only takes like one male in the mix and, and you'll find people who will like basically go over in a corner and hide sometimes. So it, it's only to start out with, not later, but at that kind of crucial start, it really makes a difference. And if you, you know, if you let them, they will play, they will build, they will do it. Well, since I said a follow-up on the point, I mean, it's really important. You can also even volunteer, and this is just my personal perspective, but I mean, I've heard Cindy Prime says this a lot of times, too, even some, like, theory in terms of video games, whereas, like, certain games that are seen to be, you know, more geared towards the hardcore gamer can also be, like, considered sometimes critically the better game, yeah. almost formal, right, yeah. in terms of arguments and stuff like that. So yeah. there's also a critical, you know, space there where I think well, I'm looking for a definitive paper on the mechanics and the, the kind of the point system of Candy Crush. I think if we can have someone do that, we will have gone a long way in game studies. And I kid you not, because that game is wicked for that. So, but I agree, there's status, you know, I, if I say I'm studying Candy Crush, you all laugh. But if I say I'm studying God of War, you're all like, yes, it's amazing. <laughs> Small groups of women that you're finding, say, in Montreal or Toronto, that are starting to create things on their own, like games or making Do you find that they're using the format of the actual physical use, but doing it in different ways? I mean, are they how are they finding theme structures and things that are not the pink games, but are possibly finding other interesting ways of using the structure? Well, I think, I mean, they're building different games. <laughs> um, they're very much building, uh, 
There's a game that came out of Dames Making Games on depression. Um, there's another one that's on the van, yeah, Seaborg, right? Um, they're really different kinds of, I would say, different kinds out, that are, circulate outside of the mainstream. Um, not pink, I don't remember pink, nope, definitely not pink. Um, there's also one for that's uh, to make you think about your body. Kara Stone's game uh, is very much that way. So there are a whole bunch of, of different games that are being developed. I mean, some of it is also given the platform, which changes possibilities. We're not talking big dev budgets of five, ten minute, million dollars and multiple people. These are single games that people are making, um, which very much changes the kinds of games that you can produce, of course. Uh, but they're, the topics are very different, and they're, they kind of are, are building this groundswell of, of, I would say not, of games that uh, I would characterize as wanting the player to have a particular kind of experience. Um, doesn't, it can be any kind of experience, but it doesn't have to be the usual kind of skulking behind walls and you know aiming well. strains of game studies that say, well, really, it's not about what's going on on the screen, right? That like, images yeah. aren't as important as like, the computational structures. And, and, right. and then when you, you know, it makes for a kind of feminist intervention on the level of representation right. weak, right? Like yeah. not the right critical approach. Right. And I think that needs to be part of the I agree, I, and I think that those are two methodologies that have to do with server scrapes and stuff like that. Um, and I think that those are the kinds of things that we need to be interrogating. We need to read those better, too. We don't actually know how to read this very well at the moment. So I agree. Yeah. I just wanted to reference the other comment or question about um, how, how, you know, how do girls make games or young men? Um, and you suggested that the subject matter could be quite different. Is there any kind of feedback loop behind the uh, between the subject matter and the, you know, the not skulking around the, the walls kind of thing, and the technology, um, is there something happening where one informs the other, and, and there's mm. you know, major changes in terms of computing and, and thinking through programming because of the, the content? I wish I could say yes. I, I think at the moment not so much. I mean. Unfortunately, we, there's a give and take at the moment. So we have really better, more accessible tools to build games, including you know, Game Maker, Game Salad, Twine, et cetera. Even Unity doesn't have a, as huge of a kind of threshold as, um, as 3D you know, Max or something like that, um, or other kind of 3D rigging systems. So we have some ways in. But those technologies limit what we can actually do right. um, and, and the kinds of experiences that we can make. So I, I see it as a push-pull at the moment. That doesn't mean that, those, that the games aren't amazing. They really are. Um, but the technology doesn't afford <coughs> certain kinds of experiences, certain kinds of narratives, et cetera, um, because it's, it can actually, you just couldn't build it in necessarily. Especially not a lot of the stuff um, is just done by individual people out of love uh, and or dr some other drive um, and not because they're being paid, not because they're going to sell it, you know, not for any of those other things. It's really um, more about use value uh, than it is anything else um, and, you know, sharing with your friends, etc. A lot of it, you're not exchanging for money. So, so has the analysis been done about those, you know, the the, uh, the kinds of programs that facilitate more accessible? Oh yeah, we have. Yes, I mean, why, why would they stop you uh, from completely? Is it just because there's not as much flexibility in the program in terms of right. uh, changing 
really deep, basic things. So yeah, you I mean, to change the, the color, but. Well, you can do more than that, and you can, some of them are, you know, it's, they're described as low floor, high ceiling. So you can go quite a long ways with them, but they're, they're not gonna make you make an epic blockbuster, although they could. Um, but they're not necessarily going to afford that um, for every user. They're, they have a really nice middle sweet spot that allow you to do something that looks good, works, bug free, et cetera, um, if you put a lot of time, sweat, and energy into it. So it's very time consuming. Even, even the low floor, high ceiling stuff is very, very time consuming. Well, thank you very Thanks. much.